Hello, I'm Danya Quick, and I'm going to give you a tutorial on how to make some simple pattern-based algorithmic music with Euterpia. Now, we'll get into what exactly pattern-based means in a minute, but here's a quick preview of what we'll be building today. Euterpia is a library for music representation and uh, algorithmic composition in Haskell. It was originally created by Paul Hudak, uh, who was my uh, PhD advisor, and I'm now the active maintainer for the library. Euterpia can export to both WAV format and also MIDI format. Today we are only going to be looking at MIDI output. So what that means is that the sounds that you're hearing are going to be coming from other software, and Euterpia is just going to be controlling what notes are played and when. We're going to be working with Euterpia version 2.0.5 today, which was released on July 3rd this year. Uh, while most of the features that I'm going to be talking about will also work with some of the recent older versions of Euterpia, I do recommend upgrading to 2.0.5, particularly if you are a Mac user, because we're going to be dealing with infinite playback, and there is a bug fix contained in this particular version that improves the performance of infinite playback on Mac. This slide shows you an overview of some of the more commonly used types in Euterpia. We have a couple of important type synonyms. So, abs pitch, which is short for absolute pitch, it's an integer representation for pitches, is just a type synonym for int, as is volume. The values that we expect for these adhere to the MIDI standard of 0 to 127. We represent duration, or dur, as a rational, and we have a few shorthands for that. So wn is short for whole note, hn is short for half note, and so on, all the way down to sixteenth note. Next we have Euterpia's music data structures. Music in Euterpia is a tree. There are two ways that you can compose musical subtrees. You can compose them in sequence, which means to play one after the other, or you can compose them in parallel, which means to play them at the same time. The leaf nodes will always be either notes or rests. You'll notice that the music data structure is a polymorphic data structure. Uh, that means that we can have music trees where the leaf nodes hold different types of data. And you'll notice that A appears where one might expect pitch information to appear. Now, traditionally, Euterpia used the music pitch data type, so every note leaf node had a duration and a pitch, uh, a pitch tuple. We're not going to deal with the pitch type today. Instead, we are going to deal with abs pitch, which is a little easier for non-musicians to work with, since there are fewer type conversions involved and less music terminology. So we're just going to work with abs pitch today. So a note will contain a duration and an abs pitch. There are also two functions worth noting here. The note function takes a duration and an A, which in our case is an abs pitch, and produces a music value. The line function composes a list of music values in sequence and creates a larger music value. So, if you have a list of numbers as abs pitch values, you can map note with a duration across them and then use line to create a melody. Now before we start talking about structure and patterns in music, let's use randomness as a baseline. It's very easy to listen to a sequence of random numbers in Euterpia. The six lines of code shown here create a sequence of random numbers called nums, which are abs pitch values between 50 and 85, and it combines them together as 16th notes to form a melody. Now here's what that sounds like. Notice that that didn't sound like it had a whole lot of structure to it. Fortunately, we can improve upon that with patterns. There are all kinds of patterns in music. However, we are only going to address one type today, which are short melodic contours of about two to four pitches. Now that might seem pretty short, so why are we worrying about such short patterns? Well, they're actually very important for what I call internal consistency in melodies. So if you think about Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, there is this repeating two-note motif that by itself is, is pretty meaningless, but it's important for the overall structure of the melody. These types of tiny motifs are also important building blocks of jazz solos. Now we're going to represent patterns as a list of pitch numbers, so abs pitch, 
relative to a zero. Now in our case, that zero will be literally the number zero. And what that means is that the pattern 0470 can have an instance that is placed somewhere else in, uh, in pitch space. So 60, 64, 67, 60 is an instance of the pattern 0470. Now, not all patterns have to start with the zero, and sometimes they don't even have to contain it at all. However, to keep things simple, we're going to stick to patterns that both contain the zero and start with it, since that makes it sort of easier to see what's going on when you're generating with them. Consider the following melody. Just think about the pitches in that melody, since the durations were actually randomly assigned. Using the definition of patterns that we just talked about, let's look at how many patterns are in this melody. If we don't allow patterns to overlap, it turns out there are only three patterns that compose this entire melody. Here they're shown color-coded, so we have the pattern 03, 05, and 0 minus 2. So 0 minus 2 is a pattern that goes down from the 0 instead of up. Now let's take a look at an algorithm that can be used to generate melodies like this. Our algorithm is going to take four inputs. The first input is going to be a pitch space called S. Now, a pitch space you can think of as a collection of all of the pitches that we can possibly play in a particular setting. Now, that, that might be every single pitch within a range, or it might be restricted. For example, a pitch space could be all of the pitches conforming to the G major scale within a particular range. We're also going to take a list of patterns to pick from, and we'll call that K. We also need to know what the last pitch generated was, which we'll call X. Now, if nothing's been generated yet, we're going to treat X as an approximate starting point. We're also going to take a distance threshold, D, which will regulate how far apart we want to allow the next pattern instance to be from the previous pattern instance. So when we're trying to find the next pattern instance, we'll first choose a pattern, P from our set of patterns, K, and we'll let P sub S be all instances of P within S, and remember S is our pitch space. So we're going to find all possible pattern instances that we could make from P within S. Then we're going to look for one particular pattern instance in P sub S that is within D half steps of X our last generated pitch. That assumes that such a solution exists. Sometimes you might back yourself into a corner and you might not have an option that's within d half steps of x, in which case you simply pick randomly. So now that we know how to generate the next pattern instance, if we have an approximate starting point, we can just call this process recursively and generate an infinite melody consisting entirely of patterns. Now there is one major caveat of this approach, and that's that it's possible to specify a pattern that has no valid instances for a particular pitch space. So for example, the pattern 012 actually has no instances in a pitch space that's in C major, because it has two uh, chromatic half steps, one right after the other, and that does not occur in C major. So we need to make sure that our patterns are designed so that they have at least some instances in the pitch space that we're working with. Now there are more flexible approaches possible, uh, but they require extra code, they complicate the algorithm, so I'm not going to talk about them today. However, some options include working with scale indices instead of pitch numbers, or you could allow fuzzy matches when trying to find pattern instances in a pitch space, or you could allow deviations from the pitch space, uh, and you could allow chromaticism in the output even if it technically violates the rules of the pitch space that you're using. Here's the code that implements that algorithm that we just talked about. Now, I'm not going to step over this line by line, but mainly what I want to point out here is how little code it took to implement this. Even if I include the lines of code used to create type synonyms to increase readability, and also a couple of lines of code not shown for the little auxiliary function for choosing randomly from a list, it takes less than 25 lines of code in total to implement this generation function, which we're calling pgen. 
Now, it also happens to be really easy to modify this function to try to avoid having duplicate pitches between the end of the previous pattern instance and the start of the next pattern instance. Although we can't guarantee it, because there's a possibility that we might not find a suitable instance that's within the distance threshold that we're looking for, we can do our best. We'll call this version of the function pgen2. Here's what generation with just a single pattern looks like. Our set of patterns k is going to consist of just one pattern for now, which will be 0, 7. Our pitch space is going to be a chromatic pitch space, so all possible pitches, from pitch number 40 to 70. We'll have a distance threshold of three half steps, and we'll try to take 40 as a general starting place, which is near the bottom of the pitch space. So we won't necessarily start at pitch number 40 exactly, but we will start close to it. Much like we generated a sequence of random numbers before, we can now generate a sequence of numbers using pgen that consists entirely of our pattern. And we can then put these numbers together to form a melody. Now notice that just from that one pattern, we get an interesting larger sort of emergent pattern of upwards cascading motion. It still doesn't sound terribly tonal though because we used a chromatic space. Now we have two options here if we want to make it tonal. We could simply filter the pitch space to try to place it in a particular key like C major or G minor. Or we can use another trick which is to retroactively impose a new key on the music value. I'm going to show you the latter one. It takes only a few lines of code to write a function that takes a pitch and forces it into being a valid member of a new pitch space. Here we have two functions. The scale to p space function takes a range, a lower and an upper bound, and a list of pitch class numbers between 0 and 11. Uh, and turns it into a pitch space within that range. So it will give you all possible cycles of that scale within the given range. The fit to p space function takes such a pitch space and a new pitch and forces it into the nearest valid member of that pitch space. We can then use that in three lines of code to turn that little piece that we just made into C minor. To do this, we'll use a function called mmap that maps a function over the leaf nodes of a music value. And here's what that sounds like. Now we're starting to get something that sounds more musical. Here's another interesting trick. Now we're going to put those notes through a fancy synthesizer instead of the default window synthesizer. And now, we're going to go a step further and add some repetition. So we're going to repeat just the first measure of that. Sounds like the start to an interesting synthesizer composition, doesn't it? As it happens, these are the techniques that I use to create a larger piece called dot matrix. Here's an example from that piece. The exact algorithm we've used here was used to generate both the high synthesizer and also the piano part in that. The only significant difference is that it used three patterns in each case instead of one. Now we have enough code in place that we can start to make a small composition. We'll use two parts. We'll make a marimba part and a plucked string part for the bass. For the marimba part, we'll use three patterns, 0, 3, 0, 5, and 0, minus 2. These are the same patterns that were used in the earlier marimba example, although the exact melody produced will be a little different. We'll place it in a C major pitch space between 50 and 80. We'll allow a distance threshold of 7, and we'll start roughly in the middle of that pitch space to generate it. We'll also use the pgen2 function 
to try to avoid duplicate pitches when possible. For the bass part, we'll use the patterns 07, 04, and 012. We'll place this in a somewhat more restricted pitch space that only makes use of the root, third, and fifth of the C major scale. One of the reasons for doing this is that if we restrict the bass part to those notes, it gives a stronger harmonic context than if we allow it the same freedom as for the treble marimba part. We'll allow a distance threshold of 12, and try to start again roughly near the middle of the space we're using, which is between 30 and 50. We'll use the original pgen function, so we'll permit duplicates. Finally, we're going to modify the bass part with a little bit of texture. So instead of interpreting directly as a melody, we're going to interpret it layered on top of itself. So we'll have one instance of the bass patterns overlain with an octave higher version of the same patterns offset slightly in time. So we'll get sort of an ostinato-like effect. Because this is going to be a plucked part with another layer on top, we'd like the note length to be shorter separated by rests. So for each pitch, we are going to create a note that is an eighth note, followed by a rest of an eighth note to allow room for the offset transposed pitch when we add the second layer. This way, only one pitch will sound at once in the bass part. And here's the end result. Finally, let's play around with those scale changing functions again. We'll change this piece into first a C minor scale, which will create an interesting change of character, and then also into C major pentatonic. Here's the C minor version first. And now the pentatonic version. I hope you enjoyed this talk, and if you want more information on Uterpia or instructions on how to install it, you can find that at the Uterpia website. You can also find out more about the sorts of research that I do on my personal website, and I have a variety of compositions uh, featuring both these techniques and many others on SoundCloud uh, at the URL shown here. So thank you, and that's all.